Awesome. So those are our house rules for today. Um, our agenda is we're going to go over um, a little bit about a, a little intro of John, who's here with us today. We'll jump into some questions about John, the company, the products, uh, the Daniel Smith community. We'll touch on a lot of different things. We'll also do a little bit of a demo and then we'll open it up to questions that some of you might have while we're watching. Um, so with that, I am going to give a little intro about our guest here, which is John Cogley. He's the owner of Daniel Smith. He joined the company in the IT department more than three decades ago, working his way up to president and CEO, and eventually buying the company in 2008. John has been the driving force behind making Daniel Smith watercolors and other products to be recognized as the world's best. Because of his commitment to innovation and to manufacturing the highest quality paints and other products, artists worldwide can rely on the performance of those products year after year. So without further ado, hello, John. Hello, it's good to see you. Good to see you, everybody. So nice to have you here with us today. Thank you for your time. I am gonna jump right into it. Um, a little bit about you. Um, are you an artist? I'm not, no. You're not an artist. <laughs> um, I do photography, did photography quite a bit of it, but not not uh, watercolors or oils, no. Mm, okay. Um, so your medium is photography then, a camera. A camera. Nice, okay, cool. Um, how do you stay creative in in running an art materials company then? Well, I'm surrounded by creative people uh, in, internally. Uh, quite a few other, quite a few of my employees are, are artists. Um, I also make it with Catherine, who's the president of JJCI. We travel the world uh, meeting with artists. So we attend, oh, it's, it's different with COVID, but it was seven months out of the year. We spent traveling, meeting with artists all over the world. Um, so thousands and thousands of artists. Um, I love the energy, energy. I love the creativity. Um, I'm always asking them, you know, what, what, what can we do better? What do you see? Are there things that would make your life easier? So um, there's just a huge amount of energy with artists. And so just taking part of that is uh, leads to creativity. Interesting. Um, so do you play around with the tools or do you just hand them off to the artists and trust what they have to say? No, I play with them all the time. I have two chemists. Um, we're always playing with uh, different pigments. It takes quite a long time to bring any type of color to the marketplace. There's lots of uh, external tests that have to be done, internal tests that have to be done. Um, so we're always playing with color. Um, so yeah, I always have my hands in. And then twice a week, uh, at least now it's once a week on Thursday, I um, have a, a live where we do um, show uh, product to artists and uh, try to be as live as possible with it. And then on a Friday, we have an artist from somewhere in the world um, who does a demonstration and uh, gives tips and techniques. Very cool. Um, talk to me a little bit about what the experience was like starting in the IT department and then working your way up to buying the company. I've never heard of a journey like that before. So I started with, um, when I was here, Dan Smith. So there is an owner back then, Daniel George Smith, who was the founder, who I'm gonna be go, going to see um, at the end of this month. I see him twice a year. Um, and he very, um, very good business person uh, beyond being just a phenomenal artist. And he sent me to every single department to learn how the company works as a part of IS and putting in systems is to make it better for the people that um, are going to use them. So he sent me to every single department to learn how the departments worked. And I spent quite a bit of time in manufacturing, almost two months. And it was during the summer. And if you've ever been around um, oils, because that time we were doing a lot of oils, the linseed oil would get hot and it, it, it had that, I think, really great smell of linseed oil. And I loved hearing the machines and talking to the people that were working there and the chemists. And that's really kind of where I fell in love with the company was, was watching, watching something that you could hold in your hand. It's almost like the creative process that you could hold in your hand that you made. And you say, you know, I had a part in making this. 
Mm. I thought that was wonderful. It was just an awesome company. That's so cool. Um, and IT back then, three decades ago, uh, you were just learning all the different departments. There was no, I mean, were there a lot of computer work to do in the IT department? There was department? a lot of computer, a lot of computer work. <laughs> you know, back then it was, um, uh, you had to budget how much computer time you were using. So it was a lot of scheduling. Mm. Um, operations part had to be done uh, at night because we were taking live orders during the day and you couldn't bring the system down. Um, it was still um, very little, the, the catalog, the computer power was very small back then, and we were doing reams of orders, you know, probably a foot, a foot and a half thick, and I'd be bursting those, the guys could uh, be able to pick them in the morning. Um, so there was lots to do, you know, I had to break myself between learning something new and making sure the business for day to day was being done on both parts of the IS. Wow, we have come a very long way. Oh my gosh, halfway. <laughs> These computers on my desk are more powerful than the machines that we had for years here at the company. That's incredible. Oh my goodness. Um, okay, let's let's talk a little bit more about the company. Um, you sort of gave us a little bit of history. Um, can you tell us more about Daniel George Smith? Yeah, Dan um, is an artist. And he went to art school. He came to uh, Washington State mm -hmm. um, from uh, Michigan. And he worked for the University of Washington. And he worked in the printing department. And at that time, the, the university, I don't know if they still have it, but certainly at that time, they wanted to help people uh, uh, have business. So they had a rule. If you could make a product as cheap or cheaper than they were buying a product from industry for, they'd buy it from you. And so he said, you know, I can do that. And he uh, focused on etching inks. And he made an etching that was an extremely good etching ink at a price point the university liked. And so they bought it. And so he continued working there a couple more years, but they bought more and more and more. And pretty soon he was able to stop working at University of Washington, um, do a uh, working out of his garage and sell to University of Washington. And from there, he just started to grow and grow and grow. Like a true entrepreneur. Yeah. That's amazing. So we um, went from etching ink to lift up ink to relief ink. And then years later, um, so he, he rented a small gas station and he heard knocks on the window and they were saying, you know, are you the same guy that's selling um, inks that are being sold in Europe, et cetera? I said, yes, I'm that guy. And so he would open up the window and he would sell them ink. And then he thought, well, you know, if I'm going to sell ink, I might as well sell the paper along with it. So then he started selling paper, then became too big for that little tiny gas station, and he opened up a storefront. And that's how we first came into retail. Oh, okay. Yeah. And then after that, you know, expand the marketplace. There was people that knew him in New York, et cetera. So we opened up the catalog, which was then national. Got it. Okay. Wow. Um, you you don't still sell, send out that catalog, do you? No, we've been we've been uh, it's been closed for years. Uh -huh. um, when we started selling to stores, et cetera, the commitment I had to them is we would no longer be in competition with them. So I made um, a, a series of dates of closing the store, closing the web and closing the catalog. And uh -huh. we've been done now for the store was the last to go. And it's been since uh, uh, November of last year. Oh, wow. Pretty recent. For the store. Yes. For the other ones, it's been several years. Got it. Um, and just for everyone in the chat here, uh, where is the headquarters? Seattle, Washington. Ah, in the mountains. Amazing. Um, Puget Sound. We're on the water. Oh, really? Yeah. I mean. Well, not that far. We're probably from the river. Less than a mile. Well, when you're looking for an inspiring space, that is pretty much like heaven for all of the watercolorists out there or the plein air artists per se. That's awesome. Um, cool. So uh, some of the other questions I had written down were already answered here, like who is Daniel Smith and when did you start working there? Um, did you always want to work at an art supply store or an art in the art supply industry or was it something you fell into? Um, it's something I fell into. I had a specific knowledge of the computer system that the company was using. Mm -hmm. And um, so I came in to work on that. And, and from there, it, uh, it just grew and grew. Uh, the one thing that companies always had is 
it's never limited its, its employees from growing. If you mm. have the ability to grow an area, you can grow. And uh, we still have that today. If you're able to do something, you know, it's, I always look, the company's always looked at, I always look at promoting from within first. Uh, it's just the reasonable thing to do. Awesome. Um, so I'm going to pause here for a sec because there are some comments in the chat, uh, questions in the chat. Um, we're looking at uh, what's your favorite lens uh, since you're into photography? Do you have a favorite? Uh, my favorite lenses are, are probably going to be the Canon and the, you know, the 300, the, the really big lenses. Um, um, I'm also a big Canon fan as well. <laughs> We do all the photography in-house for Art Snacks, so we um, definitely have those <clears throat> going on. Uh, let's see, how many people work at Daniel Smith? We have about 50 FTEs. Oh, okay. So Smaller than I imagined. Probably about 60, 60 people, but mm -hmm. when you take that into eight-hour equivalent, it's about 50. Very cool. Um, and for those of us who have been to Seattle or are interested in visiting Seattle, can you tour the plant? You know, we, we um, it takes a lot to tour the plant now there's, because there's insurance, et cetera. And mm -hmm. I have to uh, shut it down to be able to give tours. And uh, so it's, it's, the answer is kind of no, although sometimes, especially for the local um, uh, Northwest Watercolor Society here, I've opened it up because I can do it on a day that, you know, we have very little work going on. Got it. Okay. But for the most part, for the most part, no, it's making it's just, art supplies. It's just so hard to shut it down. Right. You don't think about that too often where it's like, oh, people have to go to work and do their job. They can't just have people touring around. <laughs> totally understand. Um, cool. So let's talk about Daniel Smith's community. Um, how does Daniel Smith stay active in the community, whether it's in Seattle or online? I know you mentioned before that you do weekly live streams uh, with other artists. Is there anything else that you guys do? So, for example, we would um, go and, and go to Fabron uh, Aquarelle, which has uh, 3,000 artists last year, this year, 3,000 artists. Um, we go to a lot of art shows uh, to be able to meet with artists. That's probably the, the, the best way because it's, it's actually not, it's, it's, one to, it's one to many, but you're actually seeing people and um, watching, watching them do their work, etc. Also through our brand ambassadors, we have 50 plus brand ambassadors from all over the world, and um, they're excellent in terms of um, asking questions, uh, uh, giving out information, et cetera. Um, I feel like at the same time, Daniel Smith is like a word of mouth brand. A lot of people just hear about it, finally get something to play with, and they're like hooked for life. Obviously that's true, yes. <laughs> We're still a, you know, the, the small made in Seattle company. Exactly, yeah, you gotta stay true to your roots. Um, I want to talk a little bit about products, but let me look in the comments here. Um, do you have internships available for artists? Is that something you guys offer? Um, not for not for artists. Mm -hmm. um, haven't done inter internships is something that we're looking at uh, now. Um, so I'd have to talk for artists. I talk to manufacturing, but for uh, for manufacturing, I've talked to my staff or um, artists, I've talked to marketing, but it's something that we're gonna start looking at. I see there's another one too, how long does it take to manufacture a color? And that could take, it depends on what the color is. If it's a synthetic color, um, quinacridone, perylenes, pyrroles, um, that could take anywhere from a week to 14 days. If it's a Primatech, that whole process from manufacturing the, the massive, ah, so this is, this is hematite. Hmm. So, so manufacturing this, which we do, from a massive into, into pigment, and then from the pigment into paint, 
that could take almost two and a half to three months. It's a really, really, really long process. Oh my gosh. And here we are just clicking purchase on a website. <laughs> yes, yeah, it's, it's a great, it's a great question. That's really interesting. Um, let's talk more about product. What was the first uh, Daniel Smith product that you came out with? So first Daniel Smith product was etching ink and it was uh, black number seven etching ink. Black number seven etching ink. Do you guys still sell that or no? So um, it is the, right now it is the only one that we sell. We make it in a uh, extremely large batch for a um, special customer in, in California. Oh, wow, that's amazing that you're still making it. That's great. Um, what is the best selling product at Daniel Smith? So the best selling product um, as a SKU mm -hmm. would have been, now it's a toss up between three. It depends because it's, uh, it's a worldwide market and different um, geographical areas have different usage. It used to be quinacridone gold because our main market was just uh, the US. Um, now it's quinacridone gold in the US. Internationally, it's the quinacridone burnt orange. And the Aussie red gold is not behind, that far behind the other two. So those, would be, they're very much neck and neck depending on what part of the world. Wow, that's super interesting. And is that a, is that across the board uh, oh, product, like stick, yeah. tube, pan, all that stuff? No, it can change in sticks. You mm -hmm. know, the big thing with art, um, it's, it's usually what people see around them. And yeah. that's why there's such a difference in what colors are being used. For example, Piemontite, which is a, a Primatec, and it's in the stick and also in the tubes. Very, very, very popular in Portugal, in Spain, because of the roofs and the, and the, and the kind of the way that it looks. Um, but you can go just around the world and there's just colors that um, are, are geographically really popular. Um, the natural, uh, except in, environmental friendlies are really popular in um, Norway, um, in Denmark. So it's, it's kind of interesting to hear why people buy so much in different localities. And it's definitely what you see around you. That's so interesting. Wow. I mean, I live in a, a, a city and I feel like I'm always trying to get warm colors on my palette. Oh, wow. <laughs> uh, on a nice day. Other than that, it's, it's dreary and dark and everything is made of metal or brick. So go figure. Um, let's see. I have some questions here. Uh, least popular color. What do you think? Least popular. I would, so I would say ones that... Um, I would say the luminescent, some mm -hmm. of the luminescents, because they're um, probably not, they're, they're, they're not, um, they're not run of the mill, yeah. would be the luminescent. I think once people use them, then they go, wow, those are really, really neat. Um, but it's like anything, if you don't know what it is, it, it's hard right. to, it's, you know, tend not to buy it. Yeah, especially, uh, I totally agree with the luminescent. If you don't have the other right materials, like a toned paper or, um, you know, other colors to mix with it that are not iridescent and such like that, then you we, sort of go in and blind with it. <laughs> so we have the electric blue, which is um, an iridescent, and it, it is probably one of the most popular colors. I think once people try them, it's like, oh, wow, there's a lot of things I can use that for. Right. Yeah, totally agree. Um, all right, quickly before we head into our next segment, uh, what kind of social media presence do you have? Um, active monitoring of the people that tag Daniel Smith. Um, I, I tend to believe that you guys are all over Instagram, or at least Art Snacks is always tagging Daniel Smith whenever we can. <laughs> do you I'm have sure. someone that's, uh, that's actively finding all the art on Instagram? You know, that's one thing that I, that's uh, marketing would mm -hmm. deal with that because they're really, really good at it. Right. Totally. Um, when you do your live streams, do you get like a dedicated bunch of people that come every week or? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I tried to make the uh, streams. I, I try to change it up. 
um, in the beginning, which I'll be going back to. It was how to read a color chart so people understand how to read it. I think giving an artist as many tools as possible to put in their toolbox um, is, for me, very fulfilling. And I think it's it's really good for the artist because more tools is always better. More tools in terms of understanding is always better. So how to read a color chart, understanding what is light fast versus archival, um, then about the products, you know, what is a paraben, what is a pyro, what is a quinacridone, both structurally, what are they, what are they as a pigment, and what are they as a color, how do they differ? Um, I'll, I'll be going back to that. Now it's been lately um, diff showing the colors, showing the mixes, how can you do the mixes, etc. So I try to, we try to keep it fresh. And I have uh, probably 15 artists that are with me all the time. So they can do different aspects and an answer more specific questions. And this is free too, right? Or yeah, is it a, yeah, free. oh, that's so cool. Yeah. We'd love you to all come on and join. Yeah, we will definitely send more info about your live awesome. streams out to our audience. That would be super cool. And again, it's World Watercolor Month. So yes, what better a time to learn yes. more about watercolor than now? <laughs> Um, awesome. So I am going to switch gears here. Uh, since we're talking about product, I want to take some time to show off some product. In our July box, the July Arts Next box, we featured the Daniel Smith um, paint sticks, the watercolor sticks. Um, and I wanted to know if you could show us, John, um, some of your favorite tips, tricks, techniques, anything you want to show off. Um, with the watercolor sticks? Sure. So uh, one thing is on the on our YouTube and also our Facebook, uh, we've had several artists um, who use the sticks and use them a lot, go over lots and lots of different tips and techniques. But I can show you some here. Let me flip this to here. There we go. Nice. So I just brought some of the six that I've been using. That's why they're kind of in. Uh, let's see, make that light and I'll focus for you. There we go. So it's a stick versus a tube. And we also have pans. The difference between the tubes, the stick, and the pan is just water. So it is the same exact pigment in all of them. It's the same binder, which is gum arabic in all of them. It's just the amount of water. The tubes have the most amount of water. The next thing would be the stick. So these are probably about 15% water. And then the pans, which are about 12% water. So it takes a huge amount of pigment to hold the sticks together. They're, they're just laden with pigment. We are coming out with a new product and it's a uh, watercolor um, powder and it will have zero water in it. So we'll go from zero to about 18%. But let me show you the sticks. So the sticks are really just a method to be able to hold the product in your hand. You don't have to draw with them. There are no wax in the sticks. Again, it's just pure pigment. And you can do different things. So let's do some here. Put this little camera, see if I do it this way, there we go. Um, and what kind of paper are you using? Are you using um, cold press, hot press? This is gonna be cold press and it's okay. uh, Arsh 140. Cool. I think we have that in the art snack shop. I think we have Arshes. I'll have Lee check that for me. <laughs> Lee, if you've got it, drop it in the chat. So this is going to be um, a lizard crimson. And you can do different things. You can take it from the top. So Giovanni um, from Italy takes it from the top. You have a lot of control over it. If you do that, um, you can be very, very, depending on your brush, you can be very um, specific where you put paint, how much paint you put. Mm. This right here is a great technique because I feel like some people just look at the stick and immediately think, well, let me draw what I want first and then I'll that put is, it. That, in is, water. that is so true. You know, yeah. I think people pick it, I have to draw. It's like, no, you don't. You, mm -hmm. you never ever have to draw with it if you don't want to. Um, 
This is French ultramarine. So people ask me, what's the difference between ultramarine and French ultramarine? And it's just pigment size. French mm -hmm. ultramarine is slightly larger. So it moves toward the warm or the red. Ultramarine is slightly smaller. It moves toward the green or the cool. It's the only difference. It's pigment size. So you can actually paint off the stiff. You can actually create a well right inside of here just by doing this and, and pick. You can also, and Rajat, Rajat's from India. He does this with nine of the sticks in his hand. So you can actually blend between the sticks just by taking it off the wow. tips. If you had three of them, you could do it with three, four, five, or six. So he doesn't even use a palette. He just uses his hands and he has just multiple sticks in his hand. <laughs> Again, if that's the technique that you like. You can also, and I did this just before we started, I took a knife and I made some scrapings. You could also do it with a pencil sharpener if you wanted. And Put water inside and leave it there and create the color you want. Mm. And now you've got liquid watercolor. So cool. And you do different techniques. You can do Just dip that in water. <laughs> you can stick it in water if you want to. You could put it on the paper. It's a. Uh, some artists will actually do uh, um, drawings underneath. Oh, that's cool. Oh, you, know, you could. It's really kind of an inspirational thing. It's um, I have artists in uh, India, Alison Pinto, for example, and she says it's just a tool for her. Is when she wants to get past a block, she'll put down her brush and she'll pick up a stick. And she says just from approaching her art from a different perspective, a different way, it kind of opens up what she's capable of doing. And so she'll just play with it. It's kind of like what we're, oh, go ahead. Go ahead. No, go ahead, please. I was just going to comment that it's kind of like what we're doing over here at Art Snacks. You know, it's a lot of people have never played with the uh, Daniel Smith paint sticks. And when they get it, they're like, what do I do with this? How is this going to inspire me? What can I use it with? Um, so, yeah, sometimes you just pick up a new tool and immediately get inspired and see how your art changes. So, very... Yeah, actually, I hear that a lot. I hear the, the word play when people mm -hmm. want to, you know, I, I love my art. And when I want to play, I just use something different. So it's, I mean, you, you could do lots of things with it. Um, put water down. And, you know, if you wanted to do lines, you could do lines. But if you just wanted to use it as a traditional, say you're doing plein air. Mm -hmm. I mean, just use it as a traditional, just a pan in your hand. I think you can take as much or as little off as you want. It's unbelievable how it just melts. Yeah, it's just it's just because there's so much pigment. It just it would take for me. It's not necessarily a good thing. It'll take you forever to use it because <laughs> it is just a lot, a lot of pigment. It's just massive amounts. And yeah. the, for these, when I came out, I really wanted something that would be another tool for an artist. And we sell by series. We recommend, you know, series one, two, and three, and they're different, different um, costs. Mm -hmm. In the sticks, they're all less than a series one tube of paint. And there are series one, two, and threes in the sticks, but they're all the same price. So right. um, there's only, there only one inside the sticks. So there's some examples, but again, 
very vibrant, um, loaded with pigment. So I think you'd have a lot of fun with them. Oh yeah. I'm very into this blending technique that you've demoed, um, just putting the water straight on to the color um, and picking it up from both and then just blending it. I think a lot of people are just so used to um, blending their color on a palette first, as opposed to blending it on the brush. Also, what kind of brush are you using right now? This is a Da Vinci, um, can you see that? A little blurry. A little blurry. <laughs> How about there? Oh, much better. It's, uh, I think it's upside down. I can't read it's it from Casa Neo, C-A-S-A-N-E-O. Yes. Okay. I've definitely heard that. It's probably uh, uh, it's probably not synthetic, or do you think that's a synthetic brush? I think this might be their synthetic. I have okay. uh, quite a few here that are not. Um, mm -hmm. It's a nice. It's a nice brush. Picks up a lot of. It has a really good belly. Yeah, we always try and um, test products, both synthet synthetic and real. And honestly, I think the synthetic ones perform so much better, but it also, you know, depends on the paint that you're using too. So, um, but it's good to know that synthetic works really well with uh, these sticks. This is great. I mean- so in, this, is, in this sticks, we have 51 colors. So there's mm. quite a few to choose from. We're coming out with 11 new ones. And that was recommended by um, many of the artists that are using the sticks to, to, to fill the line out. So we have neutral tint coming out, Mayan orange, olive green, ivory black, carmine, lavender, just to open up the line. But you, know, you can do all types of stuff. You can be very creative in it. And or, these are just for sticks, right? The new colors of sticks that you just- There's 11 new sticks and there's six new tubes. The okay. tubes are going to be, um, we have black, a red, green, black, a blue, orange, black. We have a King's blue deep, which is pretty, pretty very nice. We mm -hmm. have cro chromium, titanium, yellow, uh, and they'll, they'll be coming out. So they're all coming out in November. Oh, this year. Oh, that's great. We also have 22 um, new gouache colors coming out because there's many people have been asking us for years about gouache. So we're bringing out 22 to start with. And those are going to come out in November. Yeah. So a lot coming out in November. That is very exciting. We have not featured the gouache yet. So, and gouache is a movement these days. Everyone is loving gouache. <laughs> um, I am going to look at the chat here and there are a couple of questions regarding the products. Um, let's see. Does Daniel Smith have any plans to make uh, lapis lazuli into a stick? So probably not the lapis, just because the um, it's for us it's one of the most expensive things for us to make is the lapis. Mm -hmm. When we start with lapis, so this is what we start with. This is lapis. that is lapis. <laughs> this is lapis, and so to, so to cool. have this, it's we buy it by the ton. Wow. Um, and, the, and the process from going from that into pigment is just a really, really long process. And it's just, it's an expensive pigment. Mm. Um, and there's just a lot of pigment in a stick. And I don't want to change the pricing structure. I, I want it really to be um, one price for the series, the one, the two, and the three that are in it. Lapis would be very difficult for me. Got it. All right. Well, that answers that. Thank you for answering Laura's question. <laughs> um, we have Jamie asked, curious about watercolor ground product and any info on that. So Jamie, to, on, on Thursday of this week, we are going to be going over the watercolor ground on the live as part of uh, watercolor month. So yes, um, the ground is a really, really awesome uh, product. It's kind of liquid paper, you know, in a, in a, in a bottle. And we always like to say that nothing is, no surface is safe because you can put it on anything and you wait 24 hours for it to cure and you can actually um, put watercolor on it. So it's pretty awesome. You can also fix watercolor if an error as something, oh boy, I wish I wouldn't have done that, et cetera. And maybe use a staining pigment and you can't get it off your paper. You can resolve that with the watercolor ground. 
I, I just wrote down the phrase, no surface is safe. I feel like that's just a metaphor for so many art supplies out there. <laughs> Direct quote from John Cogley. Um, awesome. I do want to just uh, tap on Lee, who is in the chat here. He is posting the color chart um, for extra fine water watercolors. Thank you for posting that. Um, some more info about how we make paint, how Daniel Smith makes paint, the Prima Tech brochure. Um, Lee, also, I believe we have some of the uh, watercolor sticks that John was demoing. I think we have some in the Art Snacks shop too. I could be wrong. We might be sold out, maybe. I don't know. I didn't check before this. So, uh, Lee, if you could check, that would be awesome. I'll take um, a look. Okay, cool. Thank you. <laughs> uh, we have another question. What can you use to set watercolors if you want colors not to lift between layers? Oh, Margarita, now you're asking me questions that I don't always, I don't always know the answer to, but I can get, I can, I can get that uh, answer back to you. That feels like a tongue twister. Like if you don't want the layers to mix, uh, it's like a science project we have to go over. Um, Margarita also asked earlier, um, are there any uh, limited edition colors from rare pig pigments? You know, in the in the lab, I let the um, chemists because they're 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 um, the degree, they they know all the things to do within the lab, um, just to have fun. Um, I think fun is fun is very very important. Mm. So we will test limited pigments. We won't bring them out. Just we used to do that a long time ago. We would bring out very 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 limited colors. But it was it was because the distance between my manufacturing and the store floor was about a hundred feet. It's a whole different matter when you're selling all over the world, um, because you don't want let, you don't want to let customers down. So you want to bring out things that at least everybody can be able to um, have and enjoy. So very 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 limited things. While while we will play with those in the laboratory, uh, we won't always bring those out. I'm talking things that we could probably only make 200 tubes from. Um, we won't bring those out. It's just it's just too 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 few. Although that would be really cool. It, it would be really cool, but also <laughs> you're you're going to let somebody down. Who you know? How do you how do you pick out your your favorite 200 friends? You know, it's, it's like. I mean, I I don't know. <laughs> So interesting. Um, cool. All right, uh, Lee, thank you for dropping in uh, links from the Art Snack shop here. We've got the extra fine watercolor sticks uh, that we just featured. Uh, we have some in the shop and thank you, Lee, for sharing yeah. the coupon code. Uh, we have a World Watercolor Month uh, deal happening on the Art Snack shop. So if anybody feels like browsing, you can use the code WWM30 for 30% off. Um, so I want to transition now to um, open it up to questions here live. If you want to drop them in the chat, totally cool. Um, other than that, if you want to um, verbally ask your question, um, feel free to raise your hand, either virtual or physical. We will, well, Lee will find you actually, um, if you want to ask, but also feel free to just drop your question in the chat. Um, to get us started, I had one question that came up on Instagram earlier today that has to do with uh, the gemstone watercolors. Um, what percent of the gemstone watercolors is actual gemstone? So the, the Primatex, and the Primatex are minerals, and they're, they're a, for us, there is, we make those with 100% of the mineral that we're using. 100%, okay. That's amazing. <laughs> so I can show you real quick, because there's, there's four of them inside of the... Yeah, if you've got them, let's take a look. So this right here is hematite. And I'm trying to get the... Wow. Some crystals. So these are crystals. All these things that are shining are all crystals. 
see if I can show up in that up. I imagine that's pretty heavy too, right? Yeah, it's like holding a barbell in your hand. Okay. But that's what your car used to be made out of. Now it's made of super polymers. This is serpentine. Wow. This is from Australia. Wow, that's the natural color of the rock. That's a natural color of the rock. Wow. Yeah. That's really cool. This is soapstone. Hmm. Beautiful. And this is Piemontite. All right, I will not ask you to spell any of these, <laughs> uh, but those are pretty cool. Uh, it's not every day you get to see the rock that your paint came from. Um, those are beautiful. We have a question that just popped in. How many tubes would a chunk that size make? So those so rocks that you showed. Probably one this size right here. You kind of see it in my hands. It's, it's that big. Hmm. This would probably make about, um, probably about 15 tubes. A lot of this is going to have to be taken out. We're going, to, we're going to either float it, you can float things um, to get separation for your pigment to purify your pigment. You can float it in oils a lot of it because it'll have different, will have different weights and you can take off the part that you want, the layer you want over and over and over again. So this will probably make, you know, at least, at least 15 to 20 tubes. Wow. I did not expect that. I was thinking maybe like four tubes <laughs> per rock, but that's amazing. And that would just make one color, right? Or would you use that as a base for? No, that would just make colors? one color. That would just make, that would just be um, lapis. Oh, wow. Cool. Do you guys just have like a warehouse filled with rocks? Um, I have a mineralogist that I send all over the world. And uh -huh. so we have three locations. We have a location here in Seattle where we have our manufacturing and our administration. And then we have another one about 20 miles away that's uh, about 20,000 feet that just has product. And then another one that just is where we have the minerals and we process the minerals. Got it. Okay. So they're sort of spread out everywhere. That's yeah. so interesting. Um, all right. Another question has popped in. What do you think is the most interesting thing? artists don't realize or know about manufacturing watercolors? You know, it's an awesome process manufacturing watercolors. Um, I've been here for, as you were saying, over three decades, about 30, 34 years now. Uh, my chemist has been here over 30 years, manufacturing almost 30 years. A lot of employees, pretty close to 30. Um, if they're new, probably pretty close to 10. Mm -hmm. And when you can get to see, as you're talking about the gray skies where you're at, Sarah, when you get to look at, you know, yellows and blues and, and all day long, you're looking at colors, it doesn't really matter what the color outside is. It, it just feels really good mm -hmm. when you're looking at colors, whether you're painting with them or making them, it's the same. It feels really good. Um, I guess what they wouldn't know is the, the amount of time it takes to make paint. Mm and how just little, very small nuances, for example, the ultramarine and the French ultramarine, there's less than a 10 micron. So your width of your here is about 40 microns. There's less than a 10 micron difference between making something that would be an ultramarine versus a French ultramarine. <laughs> and your mills really have to be, they're computerized how they're, they're set because you can change the hue of a color if you're not careful. Um, wow. So it's it in itself, it's a very artistic process. It's more of a really of a of a, um, a craftsmanship making a paint. You know, my guys can can touch it and know whether you know the chemist will test it, but they can really quickly say, you know, does it have too much moisture, not enough moisture? It's amazing what people can do after uh, making paint for for you know a decade, two decades. 
So that's, that's the part. It's, it's really, it's actually, it's actually quite fun. It's, it's very, it's a very, very, very fun process. And if you've not tried it, you might want to try, try it yourself. Get a mortar and pestle, some gum arabic, some pigment. It may be really different, but even the process of trying it, whether you use it or not, doesn't really matter. It's a really cool process. It's a fun oh, yeah. process. That's really, really interesting. There is like a whole world on TikTok and YouTube of people just making paint and it is mesmerizing. Yeah, it is. Yeah, that is, that's so cool. Oh my goodness. Um, yeah, I really want to be a fly on the wall in those, in those labs. Well, it was one of the reasons that we did the Primatech and the Primatech came from Dan and I talking about um, the history of, of, of pigment. And here in America, we have the Plains Indians and we have uh, um, Inuits, and they, they both would go to rivers and they would find ochres and siennas and they would crush those and put those into an animal fat. And in the plains, they would put it on their face, you know, war paint, etc., cetera, mm. on their ponies. But people in ponies don't last. Whereas in Alaska, they would put them on totem poles, etc., And you still see the same paint that's been there for, you know, hundreds and hundreds of years so everywhere in the world people have loved the ability to do art and create art and they would find again what was around them and they would incorporate that into um, their process so it's, it's a it's a great history um i think artists and art it's just it's really super fantastic that is so cool um so a question just popped up in the chat that um I think is really interesting and something that I think about all the time uh, and has to do with sustainability. It's really hard to be sustainable in the art supply industry, but the question is given that resources are naturally occurring, how do you consider sustainability in your sourcing? So ours is extremely um, sustainable. One, mm -hmm. um, minerals are just, it's geology, just pressure and time. There's always going to be pressure. There's always going to be time. Uh, the big part is us as humans putting houses and factories, et cetera, over the top of the, the earth. But otherwise, there's always, they're always going to be there. As long as you have pressure and you have time, you're going to have minerals. Um, hmm. The minerals that we're getting aren't from big, huge factories that are trying to go after, for example, silver or gold. These are very um, small miners that are going after um specific um minerals specimens and when something breaks etc we'll buy all the things that break because for us it doesn't matter what it looks like if it's big or little or, or pieces we're gonna we can process that down into pigment mm. um, so it's very sustainable for the gum arabic the gum arabic is a um a tree to a shrub and it's it's going to exist <clears throat> Um, people have farmed it and will continue to farm it. So I would say very art, what we do is very sustainable. And a lot of our, probably the majority of the, the pigments we have are synthetics. And people always ask me, John, why isn't there a quinacridone gold? And the next one is going to be quinacridone burnt orange. Um, it stopped, it was stopped process being made last year. Um, oh. So unless you bought enough, we bought 18 years worth, you're not going to have it. But it's it's really the colors that we have that come from industry really are um, done by us as, as consumers. And do we like that new color of that car or do we want something else? And if we want something else, well, car companies don't buy that pigment and then it's no longer made. Um, mm. Interesting. Yeah, I think when I think of sustainability, at least for art snacks, it's like, well, we got to get your box to your door. So I don't know, I can't speak for all the carbon emissions that are being used, but at least you're going to get some art supplies <laughs> sent to your door. We're constantly working on ways to remain sustainable. So um, it's interesting to have that perspective from someone who is grinding rocks and making pigments and such like that. So, and you're right. I never think about gum Arabic, Arabic. Um, always being made. Um, tree, yeah. yeah, it's just, I never think about that stuff. I'm sure nobody thinks about that stuff. They're just thinking about what am I going to draw? <laughs> awesome. Um, so we've got about five minutes left. Okay. 
I want to know if anybody else has any other questions, please feel free to drop it in the chat. This is a this has been incredible, a, a wealth of information here about not only Daniel Smith, but also just making paint. Um, and I my last question is, um, can you remind us what new products are in the pipeline for Daniel Smith, if you're willing to share? Oh, yeah, yeah. So for, so for this year, um, we have the six new watercolor and tubes that are coming out. We have the 11 watercolor sticks that are coming out and 22 um, colors in gouache that will be coming out. And we're also looking, uh, I might miss it for this year, but the um, powdered paint. Um, might miss that window for this year, it might be next year. I think I'm most intrigued about that. Like I've tried so many different gouache tubes and brands, but powder paint, that I'm, I'm excited about that. That's yeah, really awesome. interesting. Awesome. Totally. Um, awesome. Okay. So uh, any other questions in the chat I'm seeing here? Um, Jennifer, I see you asked, can you start the color stick process from start of stone to the product to the product in a customer hand customer's hands. I feel like sure. we sort of discussed that, but feel yeah. free to jump in. So really quick, it's uh, for the um, the Primatech. We would take a mineral, for example, the hematite. We'd process the hematite into pigment. It's quite a long process. It's probably um, at least at least three to four weeks to do that. Um, it has to go through a series of tests, but once we have the pigment, then it's really the same process that would make a watercolor paint. The only thing is it's not going to have um, the same amount of water. It will have less water. It'll almost look like, um, like a Play-Doh um, mm. in its consistency. And then we will take it from there to process it into sticks. Um, it takes a long time to take the water out of the sticks. They're, they're probably, um, a foot long and we put them in a machine that slowly slowly takes the water out otherwise they'll they'll, they'll break and crumble and after that process we will qc it then we'll cut it then we'll uh label it and then we'll be ready so a lot of everything we do in manufacturing is just a series of steps every you know it's it's everything is um multiple process with a series of steps Right, you're not really reinventing the wheel every time you make a new color. It's pretty, yeah. pretty standardized. And so Margarita's um, question about powder paint. So Margarita, the powder paint is actually a watercolor paint. It has uh, gum arabic already in it. All you'd have to do, you can sprinkle it. You can touch it with your brush. Um, it's it's every it's a paint. It's just a different form that has zero water in it. So I think you'll really have fun with it. So interesting. Awesome. Great questions. Really. Yeah, this has honest. been so good. Um, awesome. Let me see if I've got any other questions. I think no one else on Instagram dropped anything in. So um, I want to take a moment to just thank you, John, for your time and for your knowledge and sharing all this info with us. This has been really, really wonderful. Um, how can, I'm about to ask, how can we stay in touch with you, but you have a live stream that you do every week. So absolutely, how. love to see you there. Yeah. Awesome. Um, and I believe the Instagram is Daniel Smith art materials. It's pretty long, but there's, I think there's one, only one of them. So pretty easy to track down. Um, and everyone else that is here, thank you so much for joining us live. Um, we will, we are recording this. So if you want to watch it again and hear everything else again, you are more than welcome to, um, oh, thank you. Someone dropped in Daniel Smith art Ma artist materials. That's the Instagram. Great. Um, so yeah, John, I hope that maybe in the future we can do this again. Maybe when there's another product to. launch, um, we can do more to. demos. Great. That would be, that would be awesome. Thank you, Sarah. Um, yeah. Thank you so much for joining us. Everybody else, thank, thank you. you as well. Um, and if you want to shop Art Snacks, feel free to go to shop.artsnacks.co. You can check out all of our Daniel Smith product and watercolor uh, materials as well. So thanks everyone for joining. We'll catch you next time. Okay.